this is only my second try in doing a Sunday school lesson this week, so maybe it'll happen on the second try. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Father God, as we look at the scripture, help it to um, change who we are. Because that's what scripture is supposed to do. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And this is the Sunday school lesson for the 27th, I think, of September. And we will start with verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So let's start again at who the son is. This is the letter that Paul wrote, the last letter that he wrote. He wrote it to Timothy while he's down in the dungeon awaiting death from Nero, the emperor of Rome at that time. And it is a um, very heartfelt letter. So he's saying, Therefore you, my son Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If you're going to lose somebody that's very close to you, it's good that you could be strong in Jesus. And that's what he's trying to prepare Timothy for. Um, he is telling his son, be strong because God loves you. God has provided for you. And God gave his son Jesus for you. We can be strong for the same reasons. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Timothy had spent a long time with Paul. He knew the gospel message very well. Paul had entrusted this treasure, this gospel message to him, and now Paul expects him to entrust that same treasure to other people who can proclaim the gospel the same way as Timothy has and the same way as Paul has. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, who is it that entrusted the message to us? But more than that, who have we entrusted the message to? Who's following along behind us to take our place when we go on to glory? And how are we training those people to keep the message very strong and unadulterated? Don't mess up the message of God. Let's see if I can straighten that out a little bit. Okay, um, verse 3. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And whoever it is that's walking in your footprints, coming behind you, must know that you are willing to suffer for Christ. Like Paul was willing to suffer like for Christ. He is chained in a dungeon awaiting death at Nero's hands. And he is willing to suffer. Then Paul gives three little short parables for Timothy to chew on for a while. In verse 4. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. So that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Be sure that you don't get tied up in temporary things, in projects, and forget that you are set apart to please God, who has chosen you to serve under his command. Sometimes we think, oh, well, I'm going to get around to serving God after I build my new garage, or after I finish, after I, after I, and instead we're supposed to be focused on him because he is the one that has enlisted us in his service. And that has to be the most important thing that we're doing with our lives. Verse 5. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete. See, the first one was if he was a soldier. The second one's an athlete. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Okay, Timothy, not only are you a soldier serving your commanding officer, which is God, but you're also going to have to follow the rules because at the end of the race, there's going to be a prize and you have to keep on moving towards the prize, following the rules as you go. Verse 6, the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Um, if you've ever watched a farmer... 
He has no time for himself. He gets up in the morning and works and works and works and works, comes in and eats, goes back out and works and works and works and works. So work hard, Timothy. The church needs to be paying their pastor because the pastors work so hard. Do you see where it says the farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops? Then verse 7, consider what I say. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So he gives him this three little short parables. And then he entrusts Timothy to be able to think it through and to understand it by the Holy Spirit's power and to know what he needs to do. These principles aren't hard. Think about them and you'll get them. Verse 8. Remember Christ Jesus or remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. If we keep Jesus Christ in the forefront of our brains, and the fact that he conquered death and is resurrected, we will be willing to suffer or to be imprisoned for him. And even if they come and chain us up or kill us, the word of God is not held back. Because you can't chain up God's word. We're on to verse 10. And I'm going to turn off this machine. I'll be right back. Did you miss me? There's a dehumidifier in this basement and it makes too much noise. Verse 10. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. What's he enduring? Anything anyone throws at him? For whose sake? Look in your Bible. For whose sake is he enduring this? Ah, for the sake of the people who are going to get saved through his testimony. He's willing to endure the dungeon, the chain. He's willing to be a martyr so that we can have salvation. We are his hearers. We're the ones that are benefiting from the example that he set. What a great love he had for us and for the Lord. This next section is probably an old, old hymn that was probably sung in the early church, just like the one we had in 1 Timothy. Let's examine it line by line. It starts in verse 11. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. Who's the him? For if we died with Christ, we will also live with Christ. Think of this. Paul is about to die for Christ. Might be tomorrow. And knows that he has eternal life beyond martyrdom. And he is encouraging his son, Timothy, to have that same willingness to be a martyr for Christ that Paul is. I was looking today at um, John Huss. He lived in Czech Republic. He lived in Prague. He taught at the universe, Charles University right there in Prague. And um, he was burned at the stake for his faith. One of the things that he did that made the church so angry was he preached his sermons in Czech instead of in Latin, and the people could hear what he was saying. And he was willing to stand up for what he knew was right, and they burned him at the stake. And when they burned him, he was singing a hymn. He was willing to be martyred. Verse 12 starts, If we endure, we will also reign with him. 
if Paul can make it through to being martyred tomorrow or next week or next month, then he will reign with Christ in heaven. And you too, Timothy, if you can endure to the end, don't give up, endure to the end, you will reign with Christ in heaven. And then comes the other side. If we deny him, if we deny Christ, he will also deny us. Um, if it comes to the point that they're going to kill you for your faith and you back down and say, oh, I don't believe it anymore. Like they tried to get Martin Luther to do, like they tried to get Wycliffe to do, like they tried to get Huss to do. You're facing martyrdom and you say, come on, renounce your faith. If you renounce your faith, we'll let you free. That's a very real possibility that you could back down at that time. I can say what they want to hear and not be killed. Um, but this is what Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 32. Whoever acknowledges me before men or confesses me before men, says before men, I belong to Jesus. I will acknowledge him before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my father in heaven. Let me go back to that little piece of the verse, the song. Again, it says, if we deny him, he will also deny us. Makes sense. If we say we don't know Jesus, you think of how many times you have an opportunity to stand up for Jesus. Do you do it? Or do you just kind of turn your head and walk away? Verse 13, if we are faithless without faith, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. If there are times when I do not stand strong, when I should be defending Jesus, and instead I turn my head and walk away, when the temptation at that moment weakens my faith, I can still be sure that God will remain faithful. He has put his Holy Spirit in me. He will give me that conviction to know that I've messed up. He'll call me back to himself and he'll carry me through because he is faithful no matter what. We're in verse 14. Remind them of these things. And solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Now, Timothy is reminding the people who are following along in his footsteps, the people that he has entrusted the gospel to, to don't get into fights about words. I come to, once again to this thing about words. There's a verse in the Old Testament that says, Set a watch, O Lord, set a watch before my mouth, keep the doors of my lips. If we are not careful, we will be drawn away into foolish arguments. And that foolish argument will divert all of the attention away from the real gospel message. Try to go through the day only saying what needs to be said. Try not to get into arguments about foolish nonsense. You think that you know you're right, but you probably aren't. And even if you are right, the argument is not worth pursuing. Verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Go read it again. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God 
as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. It doesn't just happen. You just don't all of a sudden wake up and be mature in the Lord. You read the word daily. You study it hard. You submit to God again and again and again. And when God tests you, he gives you a stamp of approval on what you have done with this hour, with your whole day, with your week, maybe with your lifetime. Puts that stamp of approval on you and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You do not have to shrink back in shame that you spent more time fixing your hair than studying his word, more time watching TV than witnessing to others. Make sure that you spend today handling his truth accurately, cutting it, letting it cut you, Becoming the person that God needs you to be. It's your spiritual self that you need to be feeding. And we're on verse 16. We're back to the talking again. But avoid worldly and empty chatter. For it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Have you ever seen someone's gangrene and their whole leg has to be cut off? Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. What are we avoiding? Go back in 16 and look. Worldly and empty chatter. Just talking. Not thinking, just talking, 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 talking. Not talking about the gospel, just talking. Just passing the time talking. Chatter. Talking about anything. Talking about nothing. That is not grounded in God's word. These two men, H and P, went astray themselves with speculations of what they thought might have happened. Well, you know, Christ hasn't come back yet. So maybe he did and we just missed it. Mere speculation. And as a result, their stupid idea spread like cancer through the whole body of believers. And some people actually lost their faith because of H and P running their mouths. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you repeat. You know, we studied in the book of Acts about those people in Berea, and it said the people of Berea were more noble-minded than the people of Thessalonica because they always went home and checked the word of God against what they had heard to see if it was right or not. When you come home from church, do you look at your notes from worship and line them up with what the Word of God says to make sure that you're not listening to something that wasn't true? Don't talk unless you really are hearing the Holy Spirit ask you to talk. There is a prophet named Ezekiel, and the Lord kept him quiet most of his life. He was only allowed to talk when he had a message from God to give. He couldn't say to his wife, please pass the salt. But he could say to the people that were against him, this is what the Lord says. I'd like to have that ability to always be talking what God is talking and not just talking about the salt on the potatoes. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. And then it's a quotation. The Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who know, names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. There's two things on this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. I see it as um, a big rock lying between God and me. 
And on his side, it says, I know which ones are mine. And on my side, it says, Sharon, keep away from wickedness. So it's there for both of us to remember, for him to remember that I belong to him and for me to remember that I need to make myself holy by depending on him. Verse 20. Now, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. When I think of dishonor and honor, I think of a bedpan or a slop jar, and a serving dish in my china cupboard. Each one has its own purpose, but I would never serve potatoes from the slop jar, and I would never use my best china as a slop jar. Which are you in God's plan? What is his purpose for you? Keep yourself clean, pure, don't mess around with ideas that are not holy. Don't mess around with ideas that are not holy. Boy, that sounds like you're watching what's in your brain, isn't it? That you're choosing some thoughts and throwing out other thoughts? Sounds like Paul, doesn't it? It is Paul. Okay, verse 22. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Going to run away from youthful lusts. So what am I chasing after? What are my lusts? If it is not Jesus, it has no place in my heart. If I can't wait to see the next episode of that drama, or I can't wait to read the sequel to this book. Or I can't wait to spend time gazing into the eyes of my boyfriend. Or I can't wait to see what the Steelers are going to do on the weekend. Then I'm not wholly chasing after Jesus. I am lusting after my own pleasure. Instead, chase after these things. Righteousness. Being right with God. Faith, love, and peace, and spending time with other believers. Those are the things that are worth chasing after. Verse 23. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. This is that speculation stuff again. This is, well, I think, I think this is how it might be. Stick with what the Word of God says and go with it instead. We um, must have been what was happening in Ephesus to draw people away from the true faith, right? These ignorant speculations, and Timothy needed to know how to deal with these people. Now we're on 24 to 26, and it's one of those tremendously long sentences that I don't like that Paul uses. Here we go. The Lord's bondservant, the slave of God, must not be quarrelsome. Don't try to get in a fight. But be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held by him to do his will. That's the end of the chapter. This is the reason Timothy could not get involved in those arguments about words. He had to do what was most important, which was teach the people, which was Set an example of being patient when someone was hurting him. That's hard. That's really hard. Set an example of being gentle 
as he corrected those who were going astray. And if he was gentle with them when they were rude with him, and they were going astray, maybe, just maybe, God would let them repent, and they would wake up and get out of Satan's grasp. See how they were led away by Satan to do Satan's will? It happens all the time. We must remain true to him who called us to holy living. Let me pray with you. Dear God, all this talk about holy living makes me feel so inadequate. Lord, I want to be gentle with people who are rude to me. I want to be patient and endure. It's hard stuff. I want to not spend my time chasing after things that are not worth having because they have no eternal value. It's hard. So easily to get so easy to get entangled in the things of the day and not spend that time in your word that we need to do. Help us, O oh Lord, to be faithful in big things and in little things. Help us, O oh Lord, for this hour of this day to be faithful. Help us, O oh Lord, to get to the end of the day and look back and say, Ah, oh, I see where God was moving here. I see what God did here. Here's where I was able to study God's word, that we can be people who are wholly yours. Thank you that we could spend this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next Sunday morning.